Sehr geehrter Herr Kollege Brück, sehr geehrter Herr Odening, ähm, liebe Zuhörende, liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen, liebe Studierende, herzlich willkommen zurück im Senatssaal. Der Grund, warum ich hier zwei Sätze sage und etwas Zeit nehme, bevor die Kosmosvorlesung tatsächlich startet, ist tatsächlich, um einfach noch einmal der Freude Ausdruck zu verleihen, dass wir zurück sind mit der Kosmosvorlesung im neu renovierten Senatsaal in einem frischen Ambiente, farblich neu gestaltet, mit einer perfekten Technik ausgestattet und ähm, dass wir damit jetzt eine Tradition fortsetzen können und wirklich in das 21. Jahrhundert bringen können mit einem neu ausgestatteten Senatsaal hier an der Humboldt-Universität zu Berlin. Ladies and Gentlemen, A very warm welcome from Humboldt University to Berlin tonight in the newly renovated Hall of Senate here at our university and con in a continuation of the Cosmos Lecture. Traditionally, when I have opened the Cosmos Lecture in 2019 and afterwards, I had a quote of Alexander von Humboldt typically to open the lecture. I have been sitting in my office for a while and going through a couple of books of Humboldt and, and felt, well, would I find something that really fits the talk of Professor Brück, Zero Hunger? And then I felt that basically I would have to repeat myself using the same quote that I did on at some other occasion in 2019. That's the quote from one of the Cosmos publications of Alexander von Humboldt, where he um, actually quotes his brother Wilhelm von Humboldt saying that all men are created equal and there is no such thing as different races or people of different abilities and possibilities in their lives. And I think this really perfectly fits to our talk tonight because zero hunger is a absolutely basic foundation of human rights and equal opportunities for people all around the world. And I think in this, the, the next Cosmos lecture, this evening's Cosmos le lecture here in the newly renovated Hall of Senate is a topic that Alexander von Humboldt and his brother Wilhelm von Humboldt both would love to listen and to hear as well. So welcome tonight, and I give the word to Professor Odening as the moderator of tonight's talk. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice President, Professor Schneider. Um, I also, also cordially welcome you to this uh, uh, Cosmos lecture Toward Zero Hunger, how economic research can help people live free from hunger and violence, uh, which is at the same time the inaugural Lecture of Professor uh, Tillmann uh, Brück. My name is Martin Odening, and I have the pleasure uh, to moderate uh, this lecture. Uh, first of all, let me also stress that I'm also very pleased that we can have this uh, lecture here in the newly renovated Senate Hall. I must admit, I'm sometimes a little bit frustrated about the slow progress of construction activities at uh, Humboldt University, but uh, I think this is really a good example that good things take time, and I'm very optimistic that other buildings of Humboldt University will be in a similar shape in the, in the near future. Uh, before I introduce uh, the speaker, allow me a few words about the topic. Professor Schneider did this already. Um, I think uh, uh, this is a topic uh, which is also at the heart of what we are doing in our uh, Tier Institute in the Life Science Faculty and also uh, IRI thesis. Now, the overarching uh, research topic of our institute is sustainable food production in a societal context, which is just the flip side of combating hunger. And the relevance of this topic is already documented by the fact uh, that it's the second of 17 sustainable development goals of the United Nations. Obviously, this is a very ambitious and challenging uh, goal. And let me align this with only a few facts. Between 2050 and 2015, the share of people globally suffering hunger decreased from 50% to 8%, which can be considered as a success story of agriculture which can be traced back to an increased productivity in, in agriculture due to technological change. However, since 2015, uh, the share and the absolute number of starving people increased again. According to the FAO, 
about 10% of the world population is affected by malnutrition, and malnutrition does not only mean a deficit in calories, it's also a lack of important micronutrition uh, that can uh, cause severe de development and health problems for humans. The demand for food will further increase uh, in the next decade, given that uh, world population is expected to increase to pro approximately 10 billion in 2050, uh, mainly in Africa and, and Asia. On the other hand, it's questionable whether food supply can keep pace with this development. Uh, we have realized that economic growth in the past was not always sustainable and that we have reached planet planetary boundaries. Land and water are becoming scarcer, while intensive agriculture contributes to global climate change and threatens biodiversity. Moreover, wars and armed conflicts over the world hamper agriculture production and hinder uh, food uh, with, uh, trade with food. And against this backdrop, I think some very fundamental questions arise. How can we as a society find a balance between the often conflicting objective food security on the one hand, environmental protection, climate protection on the other hand? Can we increase food production without deforestation and loss of biodiversity? Can we afford the non-use of certain production technologies as genetically modified crops? What is the role of livestock production in the context of sustainable food production? And even if there were enough food available, how can we assure a fair distribution that grants access uh, to healthy food for everyone? I'm sure that uh, Tilman Brück will touch upon at least some of these questions in his presentation. A few words about the presenter. Uh, Tilman Brück is currently Heisenberg Professor of Economic Development and Food Security at Teer Institute. At the same time, he is a team leader of the Economic Development and Food Security Group at the Leibniz Institute for Vegetable and Ornamental Crops near Berlin. He studied uh, economics at the University of Glasgow and University of Oxford, where he also received his PhD in economics. Tillman was previously professor of food security, state fragility and climate change at the Natural Resource Institute of the University of Greenwich, visiting professor at the London School of Economics and director of the renowned Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. He's also founder and director of the ISDC, the International Security and Development Center. His research interests focus on the economics of household behavior and well-being in areas affected by violent conflict, uh, including the measurement of violence in um, household service and impact evaluation of programs. Needless to say that he published extensively in, in leading journals, um, but it's worth mentioning that he also served as a, a consultant for many international governmental and non-governmental institutions such as uh, BMC, uh, BMZ, GIZ, European Commission, FAO, OECD, World Food Pro <laughs> Programme and the World Bank, just to mention a few. I now hand over to uh, Professor Tilman Brück and uh, we uh, will have a presentation of about uh, 60 minutes. Thereafter, we will have time for uh, about uh, 25 minutes for questions and comments. Tilman, the floor is yours. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Schneider. Um, thank you, Martin, for the kind introductions. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is my honor to give this Cosmos lecture as the uh, newly appointed Heisenberg Professor um, here at Humboldt University. Um, and I note that at the back, we actually have a statue of um, the name uh, giver, uh, Thea, of our institute. So it's a very appropriate place. It's not just the, the brothers who are here with us tonight. It's uh, also uh, Thea um, as the founder of, of Modern Agricultural Sciences. So a pleasure to be here in this room and to be at the university and to be with you tonight. Um, I know that many of you came to admire the fantastic renovation of this room, the Senate Hall, to allow you to do so unobtrusively, permit me to drone on meanwhile about the role of economics for zero hunger. I do hope that I will provide a good cover for your architectural outing tonight. Overcoming hunger once and for all is about more than just producing more food. Overcoming hunger is also about people making choices. Overcoming hunger is also about us collectively 
facing massive societal constraints. So overcoming hunger is about constrained optimization, which is pretty much the definition of what economics is about. In economics, we study how people maximize utility subject to a budget constraint. In real life, we don't maximize utility, but we still make many choices. Who do we want to live with? Which flat or house do we end up renting or buying? Or which bike do we uh, buy? These are big choices, and thus they are rare events. If we want to understand how people really behave every day, um, we have to understand the smaller choices, the study the common events. So just to test this theory of mine, can I just ask you, did anybody in the audience tonight got engaged or married today? If so, could you please raise your hand? No? Did anybody rent a house uh, or a flat or sign a contract to do so tonight? Can you please raise your hand? No? Did anybody buy a bike at least today? Or rent a bike? No? But could maybe, maybe somebody had breakfast at least? Did, could somebody raise their hand if you have breakfast? Yeah? Okay. Lunch? Anybody raise their hand for lunch? Okay. So this is about decisions we all share. This is about decisions everybody does every day. So we see that food is a topic on which most choices in life are taken. It is one of the most fundamental and one of the most common human decisions, at least among us here in this room, but probably out there in the real world as well. As an economics, and as economics studies decisions and their welfare implications, the study of food and food security are actually key questions in economics. But there's a second reason why today's topic has a wider significance and that is that the world is a changing. Climate change, biodiversity losses, fracturing institutions and societies, social media and digital technologies. We're living not just in a changing world, we're living in a rapidly changing world, and it's rapidly changing at an increasing pace. So the second order derivative of societal structures is actually positive. There are many forces pulling on the core of our societies. There are many constraints to consider when optimizing under these conditions. And our ability to cope with these changes, these rapid changes, this accelerating change, is probably severely limited, as the case of food can amply demonstrate. Food and food choices are omnipresent in the world, even in a world rapidly falling apart. And food is actually central to the centrifugal processes of disintegration. The world food system as we know it is basically broken and needs changing. But unless we change how we eat, how we take decisions about food, and unless we change the forces that are pulling on us while we eat, we won't succeed. So in conclusion, I will argue today that indeed we can feed the world. And indeed, we can feed the world in a sustainable way as well, preserving what we love about our planet. But the real knowledge gap, the real challenge, is that we must learn to change, and we must learn to change darn quickly. So please permit me now to run you through my argument in more detail. And to do so, I've structured my talk into five sections, and I want to look at first at some basic concepts, to understand zero hunger. Then I look at the constraints that are pulling on us, at the choices we take every day, at what we can do to help people who are hungry, the interventions, and finally wrap up with the lessons. And if I talk really quickly, I manage that in one hour. So let's see. First, some basic concepts and trends to clarify some of the ter terminology, building on what Martin Odening has already said. First, nutrition. We need to use food to support life. We need to eat a regular or balanced diet, or basically we need to get the right amount and the right mix of food. But one in three people globally are affected by some form of malnutrition. Either the quantity or the quality for them is not right. The extreme form of this, undernutrition, affects, for example, more than 150 million children worldwide today. And the rates of overweight and obesity also coming from poor nutrition 
are on the rise in all countries around the world, whether poor or rich. So nutrition affects us all. And I'm sure if you have a word with your doctor, he or she would be able to make some suggestions on how everybody can improve their nutrition. Food security is, is a multidimensional concept and it occurs when all people at all times have physical and economic access to sufficient, safe and nutritious food that meets their needs and that meets their food preferences for an active and healthy life. It's pretty complex and it has these six pillars of availability, access, utilization, stability, agency and sustainability. So we need to meet all of these in order to have food security. And I think my point is we can achieve that. I'm optimistic, it can be done, but it, um, we're not there yet by far. Only two thirds of the world population, the people in the gray circle of the world population out there, were actually food secure in 2022. So in reverse, one third were food insecure, one third. That's a lot of people, right? Both moderate and severe food insecurity, as Martin Ordening said earlier, are currently rising and they're rising at quite a high pace, both for the world at large and um, specifically in Africa, where the rates are particularly high, with up to 60% currently being moderately or severely food insecure. And that's actually data from 2022, with, for example, the war in Sudan having started since, the numbers are probably worse still. And looking around the world, Ukraine, Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen, the Sahel zone, and Gaza, the numbers are the world over a lot worse than since when these most current data were published by FAO, WFP, and others. In practice, we use some specific, relatively standardized uh, indicators. For example, the food insecurity experience scale. It's very subjective. It asks people, you know, Simple questions like, are you worried about your food intake? Have you skipped a meal today? Or have you perhaps even gone all day um, without eating? So it's a scale that goes up and gets more and more severe. It's a concept developed by FAO. It's very useful for survey-based research like we do it in my group. There's also the food consumption score, which is actually a bit more of a dietary diversity measure because it collects data on different food groups during a seven-day reference period. And what I find very interesting at the severe end of food insecurity, the reduced coping strategy index, where people are asked if they do something drastic like selling jewelry or um, forcing their daughters into early marriages in order to feed the family. And we do see that in some of the study settings we look at that these um, people do these things um, and it's very sad when they have to. Now, moving along the severity scale, hunger is, um, is an uncomfortable or painful physical sensation caused by insufficient consumption of dietary energy. If you're just a bit late for dinner, like you might be tonight listening to this lecture, that's okay. But there are people who are chronically hungry around the world. And about 700 million people or so in 2022 faced hunger, and that is a lot of people, again, that's the red circle in this diagram of the world population. And if you face hunger repeatedly, if you're chronically hungry, that can have lifetime consequences for your own health, your own well-being, your skills and your productivity, and perhaps even for that of your children and maybe even your grandchildren. So the consequences of hunger can even be passed on through the generations. Now moving further still, we look at famine, and famine is an extreme deprivation of food. Households who experience famine lack basic food or basic, are unable to fulfill basic needs, even if they employ all these adverse coping strategies like you know, selling their jewelry, some members of the household skipping a meal, etc. And at the extreme, there is starvation and death, of course, which makes it so dangerous. Here we see an image from the IPC classification, the darker, the red, the more severe. Five is famine, four is emergency, three is crisis. So, you, you know, there's a gradient and it's a classification system by different international organizations. Um, and, and you can see there are different hotspots. Um, Afghanistan, for example, yeah, is a, is a very severe. Gaza is quite tiny, but it's also very severe, of course. Let's zoom in a bit. For example, at the case of Sudan, 
with the outbreak of the severe war and violence last year, um, there are several hotspots of, of uh, hunger and, and emergency situation which are threatening to tip into outright famine, as of course we had seen it in previous years, in, in, over the years, over the decades in, in Sudan previously, which, which would be incredibly sad. Some of the factors driving this, we see uh, population displacement. Dis if you are dis forcibly displaced, it disrupts your livelihoods. And we see over a period from April 23 to November 23, from almost nobody to 5 million people being displaced in, in the country of Sudan. We see the wheat price in 2022 as a result of the war against Ukraine already being at least double what it used to be. But now with the outbreak of the violence more than trebling, there's a lot of people who cannot afford to buy wheat or to buy bread um, in Sudan anymore. And if you're displaced, it becomes very difficult to grow your own food. And if then you have maybe natural catastrophe like drought on top of that, we're talking about a poly crisis, multiple crises experienced at the same time. And I'll come back to that concept later. So Sudan is a case study of how things can go terribly wrong, but unfortunately it's not the only one. And even in Europe, we have collective memories of severe famines. For example, the Great Famine in Ireland, sometimes also known as the potato famine, because the potato crop failed repeatedly, inducing a lot of migration to the US, which has culturally um, changed the, the US um, quite significantly. The famine and genocide um, against Ukrainians in Ukraine during the Soviet times, the Holodomor, um, with several million people uh, dying, not as a result of a lack of food, but as a result of poor or maybe deliberate policy decisions taken to starve the, the Ukrainians. And perhaps lesser well known than the Battle of Stalingrad, the siege of Leningrad in Russia, 1941 to 44, killing millions of people in the city, um, shaping our perceptions of history, our perceptions of who we are, our perceptions of who we are fighting, our, our collective perceptions um, and, and shaping our politics perhaps up to today. To counter this, the United Nations declared the many uh, sustainable development goals with number two among them zero hunger, which is a very catchy word, but it actually is a broader concept. It aims to end hunger, but also to achieve food security, which is a more positive vision and to improve nutrition and promote sustainable agriculture. These things need to go hand in hand, as of course all the SDGs need to go hand in hand. These were supposed to be met by 2030, but as the data earlier showed, they're unlikely to be met. But I will argue tonight that the SDGs and SDG2 in particular are achievable in principle. So let's look in more detail at what determines food security. I will argue tonight, um, there are basically three factors if you want to break it down very simply. There are the significant constraints which pull on people like war and displacement or natural disaster. But there are also individual choices which determine how people eat and whether they're food secure or not. And especially in the richer countries, these become particularly significant. And there are things we can do, and I just put as an example here what the Food and Agricultural Organization and the World Food Program, both of them part of the UN system, what they do every day out there to try to um, achieve zero hunger. And of course, these interventions also have impacts on the choices and on the constraints. But how successful they can be, let's look at that in more detail um, in a moment. So I want to cycle through these three topics to give you my argument over how we can achieve zero hunger. So first, let's look at the constraints and which factors constrain food security. And there are many, and I've mentioned several. Conflict, weak institutions, fragility, the climate crisis, pandemics, uh, imperfect markets, gender norms, and, and if these things come together, poly crisis. So I'd like to give some examples from my research, from our research, many of my co-authors are in the room, and that's fantastic to see you all, uh, give examples from our research um, on how these factors shape food security and hunger. This is from a joint paper with my colleague Mohammed Bashir, now at the University of Toronto, but also affiliated with the Tier Institute, we're just mapping the extents of violent conflict using standard conflict event data over four years. And you can see that many countries in Africa, for example, are affected by different types of reddest battles, you know, remote explosions, shelling. They're very different events. And, and, and in our research, we differentiate what impacts they have. 
but it's pretty extensive. I mean, especially the red is really quite drastic. Yeah? There are many countries with many violent events, and battles are significant things, right? I mean, we don't usually have them here. Yeah? So for, for a country like you know, Nigeria, for example, to be so red, you know, it's quite worrying, right? We don't usually think of Nigeria as being at war, but there are a lot of conflict events in Nigeria. Yeah? And there's a lot of people suffering as a result, as much of our research has shown. If there is violence, like there used to be and still is, um, in Gaza, for example, this is a study where we collected data in, in Palestine, actually, uh, nationally representative in 2022. If you experience violence, then the red dots and the gray dots show, if you experience violence near you, um, then you are more likely to show signs of depression. And the closer the violence is, the more sign of depression you show. And if you have a poor depression score, if your number is low, then you're more likely to be poor food, uh, con have a poor or borderline food consumption score, the green bar over there. Yeah? If you have acceptable food uh, consumption score, you're more likely to have a better, higher depression score. So low depression scores are bad in this case. Okay? So more violence makes mental health problems, for example, which contributes to, to food insecurity. So the, the chains are, are quite complex in these settings. Yeah? It's not just that the, the crop is destroyed in the fighting. It's also the way the fighting continues in our head, for example. Here, this is a study we did with some colleagues um, from the Te Institute um, Hortin Lea um, in Kenya, and we added a module on how people perceive different institutions. And it turns out these vegetable farmers in rural Kenya, they think the central government, the blue line, they're really strong. They have a lot of power, but they don't use it to help. They don't give assistance to the farmers. It's the local institutions in red, despite being relatively less powerful, helping people a lot more. And fragility can be a stepping stone towards violence. There is a lot of violence, electoral violence, for example, in Kenya. And if institutions start to fracture and people think institutions are weak or ineffective or don't help me, then that can be the breeding ground for violence later on. Here we look at uh, climate shocks, um, and there are a whole range of climate shocks in Kyrgyzstan where I've been collecting panel data since 2010 um, in the so-called Life in Kyrgyzstan study with, again, several colleagues who are here tonight. And here we look at drought shocks, excessive rainfall shocks, and especially cold shocks. Now, we often think of heat shocks, and I'll talk about heat shocks in a moment. But in a country like Kyrgyzstan, high up in the mountains um, in Central Asia, landlocked, cold shocks are actually even more significant than heat shocks. And you can see here on the right, that children, young children between 0 and 19 months old, who experience cold shocks in winter, like really severe winters, and they don't grow as much as the other kids. They're stunted. And that's one of these consequences for the rest of their lives. Kids who grow up stunted perform poorer on a whole range of human development outcomes throughout their life. All the kids are less affected, still a bit, but it's the younger kids, and that's particularly worrying, yeah? Because the first thousand days, as we know, matter uh, so much in the life of a child. Here we used um, the data we collected um, in four African countries. Um, you see them here mapped um, on the left. Um, through phone surveys in the early pandemic in 2021, um, in a project joined with, uh, funded by the BMBF, joined with IGZ and ISDC, um, we asked food security indicators, and we also asked how people individually were exposed to COVID. And we can show that people who are more exposed to COVID are more likely to be food insecure, measured in this inexperienced scale. And they're also more likely to have poor diets measured with the food consumption score. And then those people who have worse food insecurity, they use a whole range of um, coping strategies, which are very adverse, like they spend their savings. Never a good idea, because once it's spent, it's gone. They borrow. You can do that once, maybe twice, but you can't do it three times. They sell their assets. And you know, if farmers start selling assets, or you know, other people, that, that reduces their future livelihoods. They reduce their non-food consumption. Um, sounds innocuous, but it might mean the kids don't go to school anymore. Yeah? And they use other more drastic coping strategies. So all those coping strategies throughout the board um, for both types of food um, insecurity indicators are drastically increased, and that's very worrying. Here, again, um, mental health um, it is actually in part determined by the COVID exposure using the same data set. But we show that there's an interesting panel from the COVID exposure, which affects food insecurity. It's quite obvious in a way, you know, because markets break down, you can't go out. 
so much, you're feeling weak, you can't uh, work in the field so much, so your income drops, etc. So, and there's less contact with other people, so if, if you have to stay at home, so there's food insecurity, but both the COVID exposure directly and then through the food insecurity, it contributes to anxiety disorders. Yeah? So people are, are worse off with their mental health. So food security can also be a channel through which other negative outcomes uh, obtain. In an online survey called Life with Corona Online, um, which we started pretty much as the pandemic started, and we surveyed people around the world and we found out that uh, the pandemic also um, changed the way people engaged with home gardening. And an astonishing 23% of our respondents in the UK uh, said that they had started growing food at home. I think people were really worried about their food security, about empty supermarket shelves. This is post-Brexit uh, uh, UK, right? They were worried about the supply chains. They were worried about things breaking down. And if markets get break down, then things get rough. And so that's where people in, in advanced economies like the UK, Australia, the United States, Finland, Germany, started um, thinking about growing their own food, which is something that really most of us don't do by any of these proportions on a, in, a, in a normal year. So imperfect markets can also constrain. Another example from Kyrgyzstan, from my colleague Damir Sinaliyev, um, who's also here tonight, who showed that for farmers in Kyrgyzstan, oddly and against expectations, it doesn't actually matter where they sell their products to whether they sell it uh, domestically or whether they sell it internationally. Kyrgyzstan is wonderful agricultural products, fruit and vegetables in particular, and they can easily sell them in the region. But the international value chains are so weak and fractious that, as you can see on the right, for household consumption, it doesn't really make a difference, or rather depends on the year. You know, sometimes the domestic marketing, sometimes the export marketing is ahead, but exporting should give a lot more revenue, and it doesn't. So it shows something about how weak those global supply chains still are. I had said norms can also matter, gender norms, for example. Here we show, um, uh, Damir and I and a colleague, we show that um, the, the bargaining inside the household, that's this oddly named first variable, um, changes or increases food insecurity within the household. Sometimes it doesn't just matter how much the whole household has. Some people in the household get more food than others, men more than women, boys more than girls. So if the bargaining of women in the household is weak, they get less food and there's food insecurity within the household. Women get less food irrespective of the level, or holding constant the level of bargaining they have. Yeah, so we also need to look within the household, within what for most economists is a black box. Our data allows that to do that very nicely. So, so that's why we did that here. Now, if these things interact, then things get even worse. And in this work for FAO, we have shown that we, we pooled data from across Africa, I think from 30 different surveys or so, and, and we looked at the determinants of the female share in agriculture in Africa. And we saw that women who were exposed to a whole range of conflict events, I showed you earlier the different types of conflict events, irrespective of which conflict event they were exposed to, they um, increased their share in agriculture as a coping strategy more than other women or more than other people who were exposed to conflict. So there was a conflict effect, there was a gender effect, and then if you interact the conflict in the gender term, there's an effect over and above that. So the interaction of two factors creates an additional burden, more than just the sum of the individual factors. And that is very important and very significant. And I think in all the discussion of, of the climate change and fragility and so on, we don't consider these extra burdens from polycrisis very much. Another example, conceptually exactly the same thing and from northeast Nigeria, you saw how much violence there was in Nigeria early in the red graph right at the beginning. Well, people there suffer from drought shocks and their drought shocks um, changes their way. Here's the outcome variable, uh, the, the strength of the social safety net. It doesn't matter so much, but the point is, the point I'm trying to make here is that poly shocks and poly crisis matter. The drought shock matters, the violence shock matters, but over and above that, people who experience both violence and droughts are even worse off than, than other people throughout all these different specifications. So we really have to pay attention to the poly crisis. So in this first section, I showed you that um, each of these things is pulling on us and making decisions to what we eat and how we eat, changing that, changing the availability, changing the institutions, etc. So let's go to the second block at, at the choices. And we have a research agenda in my group which um, looks at uh, decisions and what I'm really proud of, what I think is very important, is that we're not just looking at the global south here. We do that as well, but we also look at the global north because, as I said before, food matters to all of us. So we should understand our food choices. 
So here we started an experiment just before the pandemic that was not very clever using the amazing greenhouses at IGZ, which are really, I mean, world-class stuff, like the things you can measure in there, it's amazing. So we turned up the, you know, got ethical approval to turn up the temperature dial up to 32 degrees, which is, for most of us here in Germany, quite a bit, right? And we got our, um, we got our uh, respondents to sit there at 32 degrees, and then the idea was to have a control group at another greenhouse at a cooler temperature, and we offered them different choices um, of food on the screen. Like, would you like this now, or would you like that now? And, and basically, um, the, um, the, 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 the food characteristics matter a lot for how people choose, given that it's so hot. So the heat changes people's food characteristics. So with more heat shocks in most of the world, there are also cold shocks, but with more heat shocks, we would expect diet quality to deteriorate, yeah? Especially the, the high fat and the sweet, yeah, really stood out um, there uh, as, as, a, as a strong response, yeah? Which, which you wouldn't want to see, right? We don't want people to eat high fat and sweet stuff when it gets uh, very hot. But then we took this to Burkina Faso and collaborated with the HIDE, the Heidelberg Institute of Global Health, um, in, in one of their large DH, DFG projects. And they do experimental work. They, they take a little house like that where people live in. It's an RCT, so they randomize that. And, and this is how hot it gets usually in these houses. Um, but if you put a cool roof on top, if you put a special material on these tin roofs, then it gets this cool. This is a heat camera, right? It's quite cool. So that's just to, sh to show if you do that in the same building. But normally they cover the whole house. And what we could show is that cooler indoor temperatures in these houses um, improved the acceptable diet quality statistically significantly. So, so people being less exposed to the heat improved, and this is actually exactly the converse of what we showed. Yeah, it fits, it's the complement of what we showed in the, in the global north for the heat shock. So here we didn't expose them to extra heat, we exposed them to slightly more cool, that's a lot more ethical, and um, it, it uh, worked exactly as we thought. And then we thought, what else does heat do? Heat makes you more aggressive usually. So, so what's the effect of heat on intimate partner violence, for example? Now, that's not directly about food security, but the point is it has all sorts of effects. Um, for example, it, it has um, an impact on, on uh, intimate partner violence. Yeah? So it significantly shapes intimate partner violence, which is uh, very worrying. So if we can help people cushion against the expected heat shocks, we actually help, uh, in particular, women um, a lot uh, in places where they experience heat shocks. But more interestingly, our diets also affect our social relations. Back to the Global North, part of this fantastic um, BUA-funded project, Inclusive Food System Transitions. Again, colleagues are here tonight, which is wonderful. Here, um, we collaborated with some uh, colleagues at the Charité who were prescribing a, um, a particularly good diet. Um, and, and again, randomized into two groups, uh, perfectly uh, equal the groups. And we see that the people who follow the yellow diet, the better diet, have, on average, a statistically significantly more pro-sociality. They, they are more pro-social in their behavior than people who follow the normal diet. So here we turn this around. The better diet makes better people. I mean, don't quote me on that, but slightly more pro-social people, yeah? It's fantastic, yeah? I don't think anybody expected that, that by giving, you know, they, they thought the liver was going to be less fatty, yeah? That's the sort of thing that my colleagues were talking about. But we found out that they actually are more pro-social, pro and that's causal, yeah? That's strictly causal, so that's amazing. So that re remains to be published in a nice journal. Um, but dietary group identity more broadly shapes social relations. Um, still part of this project. We uh, went to the computer room at the T Institute, uh, not far from here, and we divided people into um, three groups. Meat eaters, that's quite clear, and vegans with a star. So vegans and vegetarians, yeah, for short, veg star ends. Um, and we asked them to allocate um, money, um, put very simply, to in-group, that's love, out-group, other people, yeah, the guys who don't eat like you, that's out-group hate, strong term, but okay, or to yourself, that's selfishness, egoism. And we found that vegans show more in-group love. All of you are vegans, I didn't ask, but probably like to hear that, whereas the meat eaters, hope there are not too many meat eaters in the room, because they don't like the out-group so much, they clearly show more out-group hate. So our social identity and, and knowing who we are and knowing who other people are shape how we treat other people. Okay, and it's actually what, what I like about this research is that it's super easy to change your dietary status. Yeah, it's very difficult to change gender. It's very difficult to change race. It's very difficult to, 
even political allegiance or something, but you can change your diet and you can change your dietary identity. And then you either show more love or you show more hate, depending on what identity you have. So it's an example of how social processes can be mediated through food choice. Food is at the center of who we are. In fact, food choice, I would say, in summary, is central to our not just natural system, because how we eat changes the climate. It's also central to our social systems. How we eat changes how we engage with other people. So food really, food choice really matters and, and is shaped by and shapes um, both constraints and, and cooperation. So let me come um, to the intervention side. Is there something we can do? Is there, an, is there any good news? And I want to argue this um, with a very specific research strand, which again, some colleagues in the audience and I have been working on for many years now, and that is the examples of home gardens and school gardens and also school meals. And I want to show how these very small measures, these very small interventions can actually do a fantastic amount of good, of course, for food security, but also for some other um, outcome variables. It's not all good news, but there's a lot of good news. And I think that, that is very uplifting and, and very encouraging. So let's see what it is. The first thing is, Home gardens, and by home gardens, I'll see, show some examples in a moment. Maybe I should have shown the picture first, but it, a home garden could be a barrel, an oil barrel filled with a bit of soil and some beans which grow up my tent in a refugee camp. It can be as simple as that, yeah? Or a tire, an old tire filled with soil and, and putting some beans or some, um, some other spinach leaves or something in there, yeah? And it can just grow with a little bit of water. Very simple intervention, very cheap, very easy to do. And we, we went to a, a very simple home garden intervention in a very conservative rural part of Western Bangladesh, close to the border with India, where women have very weak social position and, and are, are physically kept at home uh, practically nonstop almost their entire life. And, and there was a small intervention uh, organized by our colleagues at World Veg um, with funding from USAID. And, um, and they, that was three years ago. And it's a very simple intervention. And we came three years later, long after this project had finished, and we tried to find out what happened. And you see what happened in the treatment group in the continuous line. And they clearly ate more vegetables every day in grams, yeah? Like from 280 to 310 or something, yeah? A significant increase in the treatment group of still three years later eating more vegetable, which makes a huge difference to your nutrition. They also knew a lot more about food and nutrition. The teaching had worked, yeah? The, the group work with the women on you know, what's nutrition and how to eat and so on. Yeah? And as a very practical example, we asked the cooking time because it's all very well eating spinach, but if you cooked it in a curry for three hours, it doesn't really have much left. And we, we measured the cooking time and it was like, instead of over 30 minutes, it was just over 20 minutes. So a significant reduction in the cooking time of vegetables which is very good for, for diet. So, so this worked on the food security side three years later. But then even better news, we went back another three years later. So this is how tenacious we are. We went back six years later after the intervention and we still saw um, a, a positive impacts, but also, and this is the other interesting thing, in this very conservative setting, we saw that the women's decision over the home garden, their, their decision domain had increased in the, had, had remained higher. It was um, already like that earlier, but had remained higher um, it, over the course of the treatment uh, up to six years. Um, so they had a, on the sort of index, they, they showed a higher score, um, both in decision over the home garden and for women's um, empowerment. Uh, it's quite a significant increase actually. Yeah? These are abstract indices. But so the, both the food security and the food consumption of these households improved, but also there was a positive spillover into something that wasn't even intended by the people who ran the program on the role of women in society. So that's, that's very nice. Then we turned with our colleagues from World Veg to Nepal. And we set up an, a randomized controlled trial in RCT. We divided, we looked at home and school gardens and we thought, let's get the kids. Yeah, so these were, the, before in Bangladesh were women, they're adult women. Now we said, let's get them early because food preferences are formed very early in life. Yeah, I mean, the moment you drink um, the milk, yeah, it's uh, sweet and you know, so you need to catch the kids early if you want them to enjoy veggies throughout their life. So we did the full Monty. We went to the houses, we taught the mothers, you know, we helped them set up a home garden. Our colleagues in Nepal did, we didn't, but <laughs> um, I like to think we did it together. Um, and, and then the teachers at school were trained, they, they w talked to the kids, they, um, they gave classes, and, and then our colleagues who led the enumeration work, here we are administering a, a knowledge test for the kids on, on nutrition. Yeah? They see the guy in front is sort of straining a bit to find out what the hell he wanted from us. Yeah? Um, and, and we did a whole range of tests, and we found that um, in the school, in the schools and in the families who got help with the school and home gardens, 
we saw a significant increase um, in the proportion of meals eaten that included at least one vegetable, which is really important for, for food nutrition. So that worked to some extent. However, this was an area um, not far from Kathmandu um, where the earthquake in 2015 had led to a lot of disaster relief. And, and the way the, the emergency food was brought in to help feed people, because some of the schools looked like this and you know, roads were cut off, etc., and they got a lot of junk food. And we have, from qualitative research, um, our impression is that this emergency food aid, this junk food, helped change preferences um, to the worse. And our little intervention against all these billboards and the actual practice of eating instant noodles and so on, you know, it wasn't enough. These children's food preferences were shaped early, but way before we came in the aftermath as a result of the food aid, which wasn't so good. So that was sobering news. The other thing is we thought, okay, but we did see the consumption go up. How much did it help? And one huge problem here in these communities is anemia among children, especially girls. Many of the, the majority of the girls have, have very uh, low um, values and suffer anemia. So we thought maybe our green leaf vegetables, the spinach, etc., will have helped. And they did eat more. So we did a blood test, we pricked them, and we compared the control and the treatment group, and we didn't find, unfortunately, a reduction in anemia among these girls, even though they ate more. So what they eat is important, but it also has to be absorbed, and it has to be enough and to make a difference, et cetera. So I think there is a, you know, it's important to keep going and to study this holistically and together with you know, public health colleagues, for example. Another um, approach was um, we did a study for Mercy Corps in Kyrgyzstan, where, as you know by now, we have a lot of research going on and we um, looked at their school meal program where they give one hot meal to the to the kids every day and we could see that um, the more uh, here we measured in terms of number of vitamin a rich food groups the more um, healthy food was delivered to the kids and the more they ate that the less short-term hunger they had in class yeah so significant reduction in the way the kids sat there i mean a bit like you now maybe going you know if he finishes i can go home and eat yeah and that's how a lot of kids felt in class when they didn't get a school meal with the school meal less short-term hunger with more short uh, with more vitamin a rich food groups they had less hunger and their grade two numeracy dramatically improved these are like test score results yeah and it dramatically uh, uh, improved as you can see across the across the gradients there so these school meals didn't just reduce hunger they also raised numeracy because the kids could learn because their tummy was full i mean not too full but you know something in there and as we know it's easier to study when you nibble something yeah and so that's the same thing for this girl and her classmates so so that worked now um the result i promised our colleague uh, <laughs> who also works on syria we worked we've worked for for many years with um, fao and others um the british government fcdo in syria um, checking emergency interventions in agriculture there Often very simple, like distributing vegetable seed packs, for example, yeah? very low key, allowing people to, to grow home gardens. And here we can see food consumption score after two years, after three years, after four years, always positive impacts. Yeah? These interventions work really even in very difficult um, environments, in, in, in an emergency, in conflict settings. Yeah? Very small measures can have uh, an impact. These are often displaced households, you know, the poorest of the poor households. It didn't necessarily improve their reduced uh, coping strategy index. Yeah, there are still, still problems there. It doesn't solve everything, but it contributes. It helps. Um, and uh, two more examples of emergency settings. And we have an ongoing study um, with Malteser International helping internally displaced households in South Sudan. This is a picture I took in 2019. That's the Nile in the background. Doesn't it look lovely? Problem is the Nile sometimes floods and then this whole place is gone. But there's the mango tree, there's the Nile. That's a, um, a tomato patch. Yeah, it's a home garden, it's a small garden. And at the background, um, that's a, a shading yeah, to help the tomatoes grow up when they're young. So it provides extra shading for the, for the tomato plants. And Malteser, again, gave a very simple package of support to these households and you can see um, first wave was uh, treatment second wave treatment and in the third wave which is where we would expect to see the results um, the treatment group has a stronger food security score and has a, a lower food insecurity based on the fees indicator now these are still very worrying these are still borderline scores these are not high scores by any means they could be a lot higher yeah above 35 starts being acceptable so they're still below acceptable they're still only borderline but a significant divergence from the trend in the treatment in the control group yeah so we can help last example of the interventions um half moon gardens um 
this is a uh, this is a, um, a field. Yeah, this is a uh, Niger in the Sahel zone, and these half moons. You can see that's a slight slope in the picture. Yeah, I um, hope you can see it sort of drifting off. And when it rains, you know, it rains a lot, and the water just runs off and and it's gone. Yeah, next day it's all gone. It doesn't even have time to soak in. So the farmers learned now to adapt their agricultural practices. Um, to the weather, um, which where the rain is more clustered now and, and comes rarer and then more intensely to catch the rain. And you can see there's a like a muddy puddle here and there it starts to grow. Yeah. So they have these half moon gardens. Um, that was one intervention. The other intervention, that's why we actually came to the field, was to work for WFP for the Moderate Acute Malnutrition Program, where they measure the little kids at the upper arm circumference. This kid is malnourished. It's red. And then the malnourished kids, they get plumpy nut, which is this well, um, peanut paste. Um, they get these packs of peanut paste. Peanut has a lot of energy. They love it. They suck it out, yeah, and it, it, it strengthens them. If they get a peanut paste pack every day, a plumpy nut pack every day, the kids grow more, and you can help overcome some of the stunting. Unfortunately, our results showed that probably this didn't do anything. The plumpy nut by itself, it didn't work. Um, basically, our interpretation is these kids were forced to stay in places which were dire. These are drought drone rural places. You, don't, you can't really eke out a livelihood there unless you adapt, unless you learn how to change, unless you do things differently, different from the way your father did it and his father did it and his father, for example, half moon. So those households, we realized over time, where they did both half moon and they fed plumpy nut to their kids, those households, in those households, the kids did better. Yeah, they managed to get a livelihood. So you have to think combined programs. So you have a poly crisis on the one hand, but you need poly interventions on the other hand to help overcome these fundamental challenges. So summarizing this part of the talk, hunger can be beaten with some support, some very simple support. We see, for example, in Bangladesh, it strengthened food security and gender norms. In Kyrgyzstan, it strengthened food security and educational outcomes. In Nepal, it strengthened food security, but not food preferences and not anemia. But in the other emergency settings, it's also helped strengthen food security. In Niger, if it was integrated, that should, for all fairness, should have a little star behind it, yeah, saying if integrated. So, so that's fantastic news. We can do things, and that's why I remain optimistic, and that's why I think if we want to, uh, we can fix this. So what are the lessons um, from all this evidence? And I do hope I <laughs> didn't give you too much evidence, but what, what, are, what are some of the lessons that we could perhaps take home um, from this? Well, um, we found that food is central to who we are. It's actually even central to our identity and how we relate to others. And also, methodologically, in my view, it's a great model to study how we behave, just in general terms. So even if I don't care about food, it's just a really interesting topic for, for good economic um, research. Um, but food is also central to our natural socioeconomic system, our, our planetary system, our social system, our, our economic system, and its survival, indeed. We do need to change. You all know Eat Lancet Commission, etc. We need to change the way we eat. And it's tough. Yeah, it's tough being told what to eat. So that's, that's difficult, but we need to learn that quickly. So if we have hunger, I don't think today anymore, unlike in the past, that's different, but today, I don't think it really is a sign of, of a shortage in general. Because, let's face it, the world is richer than it has ever been before. We, we, are, we have so much money and so many resources in the world, you know. Um, it's, it's not really a lack of something. And I don't want to say it's just a distributional issue. No, I think it's more complicated than that. The system is vulnerable and hunger can be a symptom of its vulnerabilities. There are all these forces pulling on us, the climate, the institutions, the, the conflict, the displacement. We need to get at the root causes in order to, to overcome hunger. And that's, that's a tall order. That's, that's tough. But the flip side of that is that given the multidimensional nature of hunger, there are leverage points we can access. And I've only given the example of home and food gardens because I think it's so neat. It sums it up so nicely and it's so easily understandable what they are, that there is much we can do to overcome hunger. And so that's what I'd like to, you to, you know, there's, there's bad news out there. A lot of people, too many people are hungry, but we can alleviate it. So we won't achieve zero hunger, SDG 2, by 2030, but it can be achieved eventually if we so wish. How do we achieve it? Well, one thing is um, we have launched, the, as part of my appointment, the Zero Hunger Lab here at Humboldt University and at IGZ. Um, it's a new initiative. Um, the website is there. That went live yesterday, I think. We want to conduct interdisciplinary research um, around the world in the Zero Hunger Lab on hunger and food security, on the interplay between individual choice and institutions, and on the impact of crises, but also on the impact of the interventions to help people at the micro level. 
want to strengthen the education and training. I see some of my students from last year here are here. That's fantastic. Um, I hope this correlates with what I said last year in my, in my lectures. Um, and we want to connect partners from academia, practice, and policy, um, both in the global north and in the global south. Um, these are my co-authors, both here in Berlin and Großbeeren. I'm very grateful to the collaborations. It's so much fun to work with you. And the co-authors beyond Berlin and Brandenburg and some of the partners that we work with that make our research available to whom we are incredibly grateful. First and foremost, as part of this Heisenberg Professorship, the German Research Foundation, DFG. Thank you for your attention and I look forward to the question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Timmer. This was really a very inspiring presentation. Thank you also for sticking to the time uh, frame. And uh, I think we have now about half an hour for questions and comments. I think we, we should sit down. <laughs> um, so you, you showed this is, uh, yeah, food security is really a very complex notion. And, and what, I, what I liked was also that you gave us some examples how we can fight hunger. So this, this was, was really optimistic. I'm, I'm sure that your, your talk uh, triggered questions. Um, so don't hesitate to ask. So we agreed that, that you can ask questions in German or English as you like. Um, ah, there, there is already one. I think there, there uh, per perhaps we start here and then, <laughs> sorry. I have two questions. Um, the first one is regarding the study where you had the observation that vegans and vegetarians were more likely to share their food. I'm wondering what the confounders might be in that study. Is it maybe that vegans and vegetarians are more generous in general? That's why they switch to being vegetarian and vegan. And could it not also be an implementation to just say, hey, meat eaters, omnivores, just start being more generous and share your meat. That is one thing. And the other one is um, all these changes and the uh, uh, things that one can do to fight hunger in specific situ situations, how much, to what magnitude of effect does it actually translate when it comes to how many people get, can we get out of very insecure food situations and to how much better nutrition does it equate on the large scale and I guess there's also other people working on that problem. If we implemented all those things, how many people can we get out of hunger? Yeah, um, thank you. That's two excellent uh, questions. Uh, one talking about research that's ongoing. Um, so just to clarify the different groups, they had a budget. Uh, they earned some money in the experiments and um, they did in the, on the computer. And then they had a virtual budget which they could spend. And, and at the end of the study, they were paid out the remaining budget in, in, in real cash. So because the uh, meat eaters sharing their food with the vegans, obviously, uh, you know, it wouldn't work if they shared meat with the vegans. Yeah. So it was about sharing money, um, but money they could otherwise take home. So it was real decisions. Um, and yes, that's um, now we know that people are motivated by even artificial group behavior. Yeah, we can give people a blue t-shirt and a red t-shirt, divide them into two groups, and they will share more with the people who share the same t-shirt as what they wear. Yeah, so, so there is a sort of an artificial group belonging. But what we find is that these effects are much stronger. So um, you're asking right the heart of the question. We don't know yet why it is. It's ongoing. Um, you, we should have put it up. You can register for that study. So if you, if you want to give us answers, um, <laughs> you can still um, do this experiment. But um, I think it, it has to do with people's lived experience in part. I think um, we all go to the you know, Mensa or the canteen or you know, go out with friends and it, it triggers some fairly strong reactions. You know, if you look for memes on the internet about veganism and meat eating and so on, you know, it gets some pretty heavy stuff. So, so people feel triggered by other people eating differently. And it, it's more than the blue and the red t-shirt effect. Yeah? And so I think it's something and, and, and I think it has to do with our inability to adjust and our, you know, the, the inability to adjust our identity. So I think it goes very deep down, this food. I think it's because food is so central and, and so it raises important cultural norms about who we are and how we are. And that rubs people up a lot. Why the vegans, maybe they are, have more experience of having negotiated and, and mediated this terrain. Yeah, maybe they have a journey behind them in a sense, more than the 
you know, the meat eaters are kind of the default, if you like, culturally, historically. Yeah? So that's a hypothesis, which I, you know, remain to be tested, but that would be a strong one from my point. Um, I love your research proposal on, you know, if we did everything, how many people would we, say, lift above the critical threshold, for example. Um, I think we have to differentiate between lifting people while it lasts. We have another project, which I didn't show, where we're helping, where we're assessing, help people get in an in an um, internally displaced camp in, in um, somewhere else in South Sudan, in the rural area, where people are affected by floods. And they get help, and while they get the help, it helps them, and then the help stops, and the indicators go back to where they were before. So it's kind of like an instantaneous benefit, but no long-lasting legacy. And then there are people who get help, and it puts them on a different level. And the, the support stops, and they stay at the higher level. Right? It's a structural transformation. And, and so we have... that. Would, something we would have to differentiate because if we if people are only better off while we help them that's not I mean it might be worth it but you know whether that's sustainable it, certainly it's more expensive yeah it's a bit like social transfers like Sozialhilfe if you like yeah like while I have it I, I can lead a better life but if it stops I go back to yeah or do I use that money and you know build up a business or whatever there's always this slightly glorified version of you know you give a loan to a a poor woman in a developing country, she starts a sewing workshop and, and then from then on she takes care of herself, yeah? And we see in practice it doesn't usually work. I mean, in part the world doesn't need that many sewing workshops, yeah? So, um, yeah, but I, I don't have the answer. I don't know how many people would be. It would, um, it's worth studying, but I think that would be a, a key difference to look out for, yeah? Thank you, guys. Where is your question? Would you perhaps uh, briefly state your, your name and, and your, where your institution is from? It works okay. Well, if you want to, um, that's left going mail Well, institution might change soon because it's still Capgemini and might change tomorrow morning. <laughs> um, so actually the first thing is it's something that's been spoken about for at least 20 years. It's actually help to self-help because this notion is you bring in help, people become dependent, it becomes very expensive and you have a problem. It's been around for a while. It's been spoken about 20 years ago. I guess you've got the numerical evidence there actually, but it's it works. You help people to help themselves, and if you start it off, it works. Now, something that actually then touches on the aspect of food, what's the aspect of spoilage? So I believe I've read in the past, for example, that a lot of food in India spoils. So effectively, you have huge loss. Now, again, even if I look here at Europe, if I think, for example, about so in France, you go to your fruit and vegetable shop, you have lots of produce available. People don't buy everything, so we overproduce. We have to pay the overproduction, and what we don't buy and don't consume, we throw away. So there seems to be a huge margin there. What is or what what role does spoilage actually play in it? And then just because the person actually spoke about uh, the impact of people, I mean, I guess there's lots you could look at in things like group psychology, from the obedience of Milgram to how groups interact. There was Phil Zimbardo, and there's also other work. In the past, actually, or people referencing that if you go back thousands of years, humans had to sort of survive in tribes. So there's this habit to sort of form groups and find people that are similar to you. And that might come back to what you've actually said of the groups. And that made me think of a song by Peter Gabriel that is called Not One of Us, which touches the same topic. Thanks. Thanks. Maybe I can pick out on the food loss and wage because I think that's a really um, interesting aspect and, and the self-help we had maybe addressed previously. Um, so on the one hand, as an economist, I like to think, you know, if you want to buy some food, put it in your fridge, then, then you have an option value. You know, you could eat it or you could not eat it. Yeah. And you don't know what you want to eat tomorrow. Maybe you don't know your preferences tomorrow. And, and also you don't know if friends drop by or if you maybe want to go out instead. And, you know, and so after a week of um, having kept that lettuce in your fridge, you know, um, either you have a new British Prime Minister or you have the lettuce, yeah, but um, maybe it's rotten, yeah, maybe the lettuce rots first. And, um, but then you had the option all week of eating it, and that's also a value. So as, a, as an economist, I think, you know, some wastage is actually natural. It's like kind of like the search unemployment, yeah, like not every unemployment is bad. Sometimes you just, uh, you know, need to try to find a new job, and so you're unemployed, and, and that's okay. It's like a sort of a matching thing. And, and I mean, realistically, if you hadn't bought the letters, it's not like it'd be shipped to South Sudan. Yeah. So it's, uh, you know, I think we have to keep a sense of proportion. But of course, if we have systematically continuous losses, either because people are irrational and they keep thinking friends are going to drop by, but they never do. And so they overstock their fridge. 
um, or the distribution system is weak. So we have joint um, work which is currently under review where we um, with colleagues at the at the Tay Institute where where we look at the um, quality losses in the um, vegetable value chain yeah and we um, looked at the literature but also from the Hortin Lea project we looked at our samples you know from the field to the storage um, and, and it's not quantity losses it's quality losses so you know if you harvest that lettuce that you want to buy in the end and put in your fridge um, and leave it in the sunshine right after you harvest it. It's already, in fact, the time of the day when you harvest it affects the nutrient component in the, in the lettuce, yeah? And then how you store it in transport, how you keep it in the supermarket, do you keep it in the cold shelf or do you keep it just in a normal shelf, yeah? Um, how do you bring it home? Um, how do you keep it at home, etc.? How long do you keep it, yeah? All these things make a difference. And so you might end up eating it, but if you've lost three quarters of the nutrients, or like I said with the spinach, if you boil the spinach to, to oblivion, you know, then, then that's also a food quality uh, loss. And so um, that I'm actually more worried about, yeah? That, um, so investing in market infrastructures, covered markets, shady markets, you know, even the tomato plants were growing in the shade because they don't like too much heat, yeah? So, so I think that is maybe something that we, we, we focus a lot on food that's thrown away. And yes, it exists as a phenomenon, but I'm just as worried about food get eaten. But, you know, a yellow lettuce leaf is, is not really yummy yeah, and not really healthy either. There's a, there are two questions, one in, in the very back and the next one here in the, in the middle. Thanks a lot for that interesting talk. Um, I'm a biochemist here at Humboldt, and there also comes in a bit my, my question. You mentioned shortly that um, hunger and, let's call it trauma, uh, also affects then the generation afterwards. And there we are immediately in, um, connected to epigenetics or genetics. Can you comment there on the effect if you did some research regarding epigenetics and uh, how you can actually change behavior of people if you fight against such strong things as genes? Um, I leave the biology to other members of my family, but um, I <laughs> um, but there, there are at least two transmission mechanisms. Um, one is that um, uh, pregnant and lactating mothers who, who suffer from shocks and adverse consequences and, and trauma and malnutrition, and, but also directly from violence, for example, or from displacement, you know, um, or as one colleague with our uh, Kyrgyz data uh, showed, um, uh, women who were married against um, their wish, who were forcibly married in, in Kyrgyzstan, um, their babies have a lower birth weight. Yeah? So, so um, in utero trauma uh, for the baby has co lifetime consequences for that child. Yeah? And then if the child is um, stunted, is lower cognitive ability, lower lifetime earnings, lower productivity, etc., you know, chances are that their children in turn suffer from that. Yeah? So, so we can show, um, there's a very interesting paper, which I wish I had written myself but didn't, um, from the Biafra war um, in Nigeria, um, where uh, forcibly displaced women had granddaughters um, who were more stunted because their grandmothers um, suffered from the war consequences. Yeah? And, and so it's both the in utero and, and then later, later life events which, which can have a, a knock-on effect through socioeconomic circumstances. Yeah? So that's the channels that I'm more familiar with. The within body, other channels I have to leave to other people. Yeah? Okay, there was another question in the middle, in the middle row. Oh. Hi, thank you for an excellent talk. Um, I'm Alice Huko, a pediatrician at the Charité, also in international public health currently. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate on the study you had mentioned earlier with the proximity of conflict related to depression score and that then related to food consumption scores. How were you able to differentiate um, the food consumption scores being related to the depression rather than lack of access to food because of conflict in the area? Would you mind just maybe saying a few more words about that study? Yeah, sure. So um, that's being submitted to a journal just now. So A, it's not yet peer reviewed. And B, um, I, I want to be very explicit that this is not causal. And I hope I didn't give the impression it was because, yeah, it's correlation at this point. Yeah, I think we can move to the uh, causal analysis to, to make a very technical comment in the next uh, analysis, round of analysis in the next uh, paper we want to write with this data. But currently what we are seeing is that, um, so the um, we have both within survey and from 
separate data sets, information on where in Gaza and generally in Palestine, also in West Bank, um, conflict uh, events um, occurred. Yeah, so we know from the from other data sets also that you know there was a, a battle or a, a fighting, a shooting, an, an explosion, or you know these different types of conflict events, exactly where they were, and we know exactly where the household is. So I know whether you know the, the violent event was over there, and I'm here, and I know the distance between these two. And what we can show is that the further away the distance of events that happened either um, the year before or even the previous five years, in total, the from now till you know from the moment of the survey, the previous five years that they have an impact on my health status, mental health status today. So that's strictly speaking correlational, but actually I think you know, that it suggests that uh, you know, the reverse causality would be very hard to argue, yeah? that my mental health today determines what happened in conflict events in the past. So that's the first step of the argument. And the conflict events that happen closer to me have a stronger impact on my mental health or you know, stronger correlation with my mental health. And, and if they were temporarily closer, yeah, the last year as opposed to the five years. The other thing is that we see that um, people who have these, uh, there's a strong correlation between the depression scores on the one hand and the food security status. Which way around it runs in this study, I don't know, but um, it's really striking and it's significant. Yeah? So I, I don't know yet what the mechanisms are, but my very general point is that, you know, if if you have a high, and it's not a clinical diagnosis of depression, it's a, it's a survey-based thing and it's an in-person survey and, you know, so it's a, it's a suggestion of, you know, some form of depression order. But if, if you answer a lot of these questions, you know, and, and chances are you suffer some burden of depression, you know, you have less energy, you have less drive, you might find it more difficult leaving the house, you, you know, you're less likely to, you're more likely to be unemployed, you're more likely to have a low-paying job, etc. against the background of high unemployment already. Um, it's, it's quite logical that you're not going to be able to feed yourself and your family as well. Yeah? So, so I, I find that a very strong narrative. Yeah? And, and what we see is a lot of programs which tackle one or the other. And I think that's what we're really trying to get to here. The study was co-funded by the World Bank um, and they're interested in jobs. Well, yeah, but they're saying we're doing interventions to help people get into a job. And we're saying if these people suffer from depression, giving them a skill training is not going to get them into a job because you need to address the the joint um, problem of somebody you know having a mental health burden and being unemployed yeah and i think that's a programmatic implication which is not yet very widely spread or very well understood but in a conflict or post-conflict um, setting this is likely to be a, a significant issue yeah happy to chat more afterwards then <laughs> so weiter The mic is behind you. Economics. Oh, sorry. Matthias Walter, Department of Agriculture Economics at Humboldt. Um, uh, I was um, very much, much impressed about the wide scope of your um, approach. Um, uh, I think that is a good example for interdisciplinary work. Um, um, and uh, because you deny that you have much to do with biology, but in fact you did, and uh, psychology and uh, and. Um, medicine and uh, uh, several other aspects, uh, food. Uh, so um, um, the, my question is, when you, um, when you work for an international organization and on one of your, on your research questions, uh, do you plan this from the very beginning or in the, in the course of your work, do you f try to find other colleagues and, and, and disciplines that, um, that you find out you might need? Yeah, thank you, Matthias. Um, I think on the one hand, um, I just really enjoy teamwork and I, I, I think research is better if we do it jointly and everybody contributes something and it's not just a disciplinary background, but, but it's also, you know, just personal experience and, you know, somebody's really good with data and somebody's really good with, you know, the literature and somebody's really good at writing it up or whatever. So, so, you know, having large author teams, I think it's just a really productive way of doing it. And, and we, you know, work less in silos and, and also, you know, many other disciplines have very many interesting people in them and economists can be a bit boring. And so it's nice to, you know, branch out a bit. Yeah. So that's one, one thing, um, but but the other thing is, I really like to have teams with people from different places. And you know, I, I'm a maybe a topical, maybe a mythological person, but I'm not a country expert. Yeah, so I'm not an expert on Sudan, I'm not an expert on Syria, I'm not an expert on Kyrgyzstan. And I I know something about these countries, but it's very modest what I know. And so so I really like to collaborate with people from those countries, forming teams that way. That I think is also really um, really important and, and really interesting. 
then um, my preferred studies are where somebody says, you know, we, so for example, in the home garden domain, many practitioners came to us and said, interesting that you're doing this from a research point of view. We've been running home garden programs for 30 years and we've never questioned whether they work or not. We always assume they do. Yeah, and I say, oh, <laughs> and increasingly um, donors for development and humanitarian projects require a theory of change. You know, why are you doing this? Yeah, and so they write a theory of change and I read it and I go, this is not state of the art in the literature. You know, we know more than this. Yeah, so we can, so first of all, we can advise them on how to, you know, make a better foundation, better scientific foundation to this. Yeah, and secondly, we can say, we know some things about home gardens, but we don't know everything. So why don't we, you, on the one hand, we help you figure out what we know, and you do that. But on the other hand, we help you figure out how to go beyond that. And I think an example from Syria, a country you care about deeply, FAO said to us, we do these training programs, you know, farmer field schools, that sort of thing. And we give these seed kits to simplify it a bit, yeah? And so we did the study and we were trying to be very polite about it because, I mean, they had been very nice. It was a nice collaboration. And we said, maybe you want to rethink your training a little bit, yeah? You know, we put it sort of very British, yeah? And they said, what do you mean? They don't work? And we said, no, they don't, not at all, yeah? And so they said, we, we knew that actually, but we, we weren't sure. And so it's good you checked it because we, we suspected they didn't. And so they stopped it and they said, and then they went to the donor and said, our, our program didn't work. You know, I'm sorry about that. And, and the donor said, it's fantastic that you tell us because we, it was BMZ, I think, was one of them, but there were also British money and EU money. And they said, we prefer you acknowledging it doesn't work, and then we shift resources into what works. And what works were these vegetable seed kits and other interventions. One of the programs reduced uh, girl marriages in the affected families by 80%. Yeah? These are 12, 13, 14-year-old girls who are against their will forced into marriage with much older men. Um, so that the family has, an, has a lower head count and can afford to feed the rest of the family. Yeah? That's a human rights violation in line with what... Um, both my previous speakers said. So, um, you know, that was a fantastic uh, result, yeah? And so they said, why don't we fund programs like that, which, which proven and causally, you know, rigorously established that um, the reduction in, in girl marriages, um, uh, as opposed to the trainings, which somehow seem to have been a bit of a, you know, you all meet, talk, and it didn't do anything, yeah? So the trainings in Bangladesh for the women, that worked, but in the, in, for whatever reason, I don't know why. Sometimes we don't know why something doesn't work, yeah? And so that's the sort of evidence. And, and there we had a cutting edge, that's research. That, like, if you look at the literature, you don't know what agricultural interventions work in an active conflict setting, yeah? I think we're the only group in the world that collects panel data in, in Syria, yeah? And, and we would like to set up, um, if we manage, uh, uh, with support from the BMZ to set up a new Sudan observatory where we monitor what's happening in the country, you know, in real time with uh, phone surveys and others, you know, understanding the food security status of the people in the conflict zones in Darfur and elsewhere. Yeah, so, so I think um, th there is no research on that. We don't know how people live in these settings. And yet, increasingly, the SDGs are not being met in conflict and violent settings. So we need to work more on those settings in teams and multidisciplinary, but, but pooling data, bringing things together and establishing data infrastructures, which allow us to do cutting edge research. Yeah. Professor Schneider. First, thank you for this excellent and inspiring contribution to the Cosmos lecture series. I would wish to come back to the to the question that has been raised at the very beginning of our discussion. I understand that our food choices are determined, for example, by cold or by heat stress. That's kind of obvious. But if you look at the relation between the perspectives of people to the world and their dietary uh, decisions, like those vegan people and the meat eaters, would it be our perspectives to the world that determine our dietary decisions, or is it the dietary decisions and the food that determines our perspectives to the world? I understood that you were kind of following the second hypothesis. I think that could be challenged. It might be vice versa. It might simply be that people with a specific perspective, uh, um, with a specific uh, perspective to the world, take a um, another decision on their food which is in line with what they think about the world. And then changing dietary maybe is more difficult than changing perspectives. No, it's, sorry, the other way around. Since it's probably more difficult to change, change the perspectives of people to the world, that might impact on our abilities to change dietary decisions of people, especially here in the West. 
Um, thank you. I think that's an excellent uh, academic point and, and, and of high policy relevance. Yeah. So um, I, I think I'm covered though, because <laughs> I had one slide um, where I put the decision to eat in the middle is my summary slide for that choice section. And on the one hand, I had a son, and on the other hand, I had a, a group of people. And the, I, I, today, last minute, I changed the arrows because they had been pointing out. And I thought, no, that's not quite what I want to say. And I inserted arrows which pointed both ways on both sides of the decision to eat. So I think these shape each other. And there's a huge endogeneity problem, and that's difficult to study. So that makes it an interesting academic conundrum, yeah, because it could run both ways. But the way we try to resolve that is through the experimental setting, the very, very strict you know, lab environment, uh, like a psychology lab or behavioral economics lab, um, where we then can control exactly all through in the field RCTs, these randomized controlled trials, where, I, where only one thing is different. And, and for example, the, the heat or cold exposure, for example, yeah, or the group experience or something like that. And so I, I can control in a in an academic way, you know, what I change about these things. That's what I think is so important about the, the lab work and the art. That's why methodology is so important, I think, yeah? Because otherwise we're just talking about what could be and maybe and, you know, so if I, yeah. It, I mean, I could do, I, I, I'm not saying other methods might not be interesting, could have a mixed method approach and ask people why do you do that and, you know, do a, like a more ethnographic approach and that would be interesting too. But my contribution to the debate would be the quantitative approach and would be trying to isolate the causal factors that drive one or the other. And I mean, probably it's a little bit of both empirically. Yeah, there are people where it got, runs one way and there are cases where it runs the other way. But understanding the magnitude and the scale, I think, is important for policy because ultimately, like I said, the objective is we must get faster, right? We, we must get onto that Eat Lancet diet, yeah? And I think it can be quite tasty, but I can't quite picture it yet, yeah? And so, um, you know, whether I come from the world view and it changes my food, or whether I come from food and it, you know, influences my worldview, you know, from a from a planetary boundary point of view, you know, we have to get there today and not tomorrow. Yeah. And so so this the speed of change and coming back to that hypothesis of mine, yeah. I, you know, yes, it's important to know which way it cuts, but then how do I get people to the to where they should be even faster than what we have been managing so far? I think that's the remaining problem, which is probably the biggest problem, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there there is another question. Thank you. I'm Paul. I work at IGZ. And my question and my thoughts are regarding to countries that are at the same time big food producers and exporters, such as Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, or other countries, but they are also countries which detain uh, hotspots of biodiversity. I would like to know a little bit more about, um, how do I say, the indices of malnutrition or food insecurity, because it's a little bit contradictory if the, the country has a, a huge biodiversity, but at the same time produce only, for example, soybean or bananas. And could you bring a little bit more about some data concerning the indices of malnutrition and food insecurity in those countries, please? Sure. Uh, obrigado. <laughs> um, great question. Though I'm not a, not a country expert, like I said before, so I don't know about Brazil that much, um, for example, um, but B, I work at the micro level. And so what I think is very striking is that the status of a country, in my perception and experience, is not really, a, a, for most cases, except perhaps at the extremes, a determinant of the individual you know, citizen's food security status. So in middle income country like Brazil, you have a you know, significant proportion of the population who's malnourished because of too much food and the wrong food and you know, they're obese and, 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 and so on. Yeah? So they don't move enough and they eat the wrong food. So you have this phenomenon also in other countries, uh, you know, urban, in urban slums even. Yeah? And that could be even people who are maybe more on the lower income scale. But you know, the snack food, street food, you know, we glorify it here in, 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 in the global north, you know, the, oh, you know, like whatever, Peruvian street food, you know, there's a van outside probably during the day. Yeah, that's cool. But but a lot of snack food is actually really unhealthy because it's very fatty, et cetera. Yeah. And it's fat and because it's fatty, it sort of um, stays food safe, but it's not healthy. Yeah. Um, so so in different population subgroups, you can have very different um, nutritional challenges. Um, but you also have people. Uh, who might be very food insecure. And ironically, they might be the people working the land. Yeah, I mean, it could be urban residents, but it could be rural residents. It could be people where the biodiversity loss is happening. It could be where the 
you know, Amazon is being done, burned down to grow soya or to grow uh, beef or both. Yeah, and so I think we need to disc. We need to. We, we live in a world where you know you can buy blueberries from Peru in the local Edeka. Yeah, it's bizarre. Yeah, so um, we we don't. The, the, food, the exporting status of a country is not a predeterminant of the or, or an explanatory variable of the food security status of the people in the country. Yeah? The exception, I said, was maybe at the extreme, like a country like Niger, you know, who, to the best of my knowledge, don't you know, export any significant amounts of food, you know, where there's maybe a significant um, calorie shortage in what they produce. Yeah? So, and, and we saw it with the rising price of food grains. I mean, Sudan, yeah, we, you remember the price chart, um, war in Ukraine doubled the prices, war in Sudan more than tripled the prices, yeah? There's not much uh, wheat being grown in many MENA countries in particular. They depend on Ukrainian wheat exports and to some extent Russian wheat exports as well. And so to the extent that they fall away, you know, their macro story has a micro implication on the, on the food security status of people, yeah? But that's not because of, so that doesn't affect the exporting country, that affects the importing country. That's a different story. And their global, global markets matter a lot. Yeah? But um, yes, it could be that if beef prices go through the roof, you know, some laborers in Brazil who are better paid than if the beef prices don't go through the roof, yes, but that doesn't determine the majority of the food security status in Brazil, I would, I would imagine. Yeah? I think it's, um, but, but it's different for, for Sudan or for Libya or Syria or Lebanon, yeah? who don't produce their own wheat um, any more or not enough of it anyway, yeah? Perhaps I uh, take the opportunity to ask uh, one question. We are running out of time, but I would like to ask uh, one thing. So I found this concept of polycrisis very, very interesting and, and asked myself, is there a chance to yeah, quantify the joint risk of, of all these event, pandemic and uh, weather shocks and, and wars. So uh, given that there may be interdependencies between these, uh, these events, so in, 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 in finance we have sophisticated statistical concepts to, to calculate joint probabilities of, of certain events. Is it, is it principle, in principle possible to quantify the likelihood of the joint um, emergence of, of several crisis or doesn't the data allow so is, is there a combined risk index that covers all the things that may may affect uh, the, the, the 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 nutritional status of yeah the country? Um, thank you so um at the end of each research paper we say more research needs to be done yeah and maybe that's how we're going to end this meeting as well yeah so so this is another excellent research <laughs> proposal um, now, again, I work at the micro level, so I take case studies, you know, Northeast Nigeria, we have this uh, interaction term that's significant, etc. Yeah, um, and, and in, we're, we're sort of in my group, we're running through this, we're trying to find as many examples of where we get, you know, maybe even two or three, it gets a bit complicated econometrically, yeah, if you have then interaction terms between three different things. But, but basically, I think we're, we're making a principal point, pay attention to these interactions, yeah, Ta pay attention to the double burden or pay attention to the intersectionality of it, if you want to put it that, yeah. We had a, a project on uh, gender dimensions of forced displacement, and that was the same thing. If you're forcibly, forcibly displaced, it's terrible. If you're women in some societies, it's terrible. But if you're forcibly displaced women, they, they suffered over and above um, what, what anybody else suffered, yeah. And so, so I think these overlapping risks are, are significant. But I must say, I hadn't, being a micro person, I hadn't thought of adding them up. But, but for most countries, we have the data, and it probably it would be possible, and it might be super interesting. And if we could sort of, in a sense, decompose total global risk faced by everybody into, you know, risk from this and risk from that and risk from this and that, yeah, um, I think that would be a, a fascinating story, and that would allow us to tell the hotspots, you know, of where we should also then focus maybe our attention, not just from a research point of view, but from a from an intervention point of view. Yeah. So great, great project. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I uh, think we have to come to an end. Uh, so I don't have a quote from <laughs> Alexander von Humboldt, but I agree to our vice president that, that um, he would have liked it to, to attend this lecture. Uh, so von Humboldt, the name saint of this lecture, uh, for several reasons. So um, I read that uh, von Humboldt was uh, also concerned about uh, feeding a growing uh, world even two centuries ago. And to this end, he analyzed the, the prevalence of, of certain groups that could be used uh, to feed the world and, and the um, habitat conditions all over the world. So I, I'm sure that uh, he liked that, uh, would have liked this topic. And um, second thing, it became clear that solutions to these uh, complex uh, problems uh, 
of, of nutrition um, can all be um, uh, tackled with an interdisciplinary approach, uh, just in the spirit of uh, Van Humboldt and um, natural science, experimental science, but also social science and economics have to come together to develop um, feasible solutions for efficient and sustainable food production. And what I also liked is uh, that, that you really gave very positive and constructive examples how we can uh, mitigate hunger. And uh, yes, I hope that uh, we will all, our university, our institute, uh, Erit Thesis, will be endowed with sufficient resources to continue uh, this research <laughs> even in times uh, with, uh, with battery shortages. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Brück, and also thank you to you uh, for the very vivid discussion, interesting questions. The only thing that remains to do is to give you an, uh, a gift, um, <laughs> which I now uh, have to do. Yeah, this is the concussion. <laughs> uh, and uh, a nice uh, book, I must admit, I don't know, but... Um, <laughs> Lovely. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, and I will make sure to put nutritious drinks in this. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.